Good afternoon. My name is David Fraze, and this is the Visa webinar. Uh, and once again today, we welcome Chris Buxton, who's Chief Executive of the British Fluid Power Association. Good afternoon, Chris. Good afternoon, David, and hopefully my video is now visible to you. It is indeed, and uh, as ever, I've worn a tie uh, because you're always as smart as a guardsman, as they say. And uh, well, Doesn't have anyway, um, uh, and, and my tie, shirt and tie, I tend to wear for the rest of the day uh, because it, it feels kind of good. Uh, I wish we could do it more often. Well, um, if we've, got done done to... we've raised the sartorial standards of the uh, the industry. Uh, well, yeah, it goes particularly well with my shorts and flip flops. Uh, the sun <laughs> is shining. Uh, I'm heading out to my balcony. Have a good afternoon, and uh, I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much, David. I shall go to sharing my screen now, and hopefully everybody can um, can actually see that. Um, we'll just make it start. Frantic clicking of buttons. Okay. Well, a very warm welcome to everybody, and very good morning. Um, we have um, almost a thousand people. Uh, in attendance with us this morning. So um, we're obviously doing something right and the subject matter um, is obviously striking a chord with everybody. Um, my job isn't to take up valuable time for the speakers from the speakers, so I'll very briefly, as I always do, explain um, who Shep are in a couple of slides and then uh, the purpose of today's webinar, uh, although I'm sure that you're more than aware of exactly what that's all about. So who exactly are SHEP? Well, um, as you have seen me say in the past, for far too long, uh, the HSC has been regarded as some kind of um, police force, if you like, um, actively looking to, to find people who fall foul of the regulations and then do terrible things to their businesses. But of course, um, that isn't the, the reality. In reality, they want to um, do avoid at all costs any kind of litigation and prosecutions. And to that extent, as it says in the, um, the plan, the helping GB work well, they actually want to just protect lives and improve our working environments. And so to that extent, we have a common goal that the HSE, like all of us, are limited by resources and time, and so they need support. They need our support as industry. And the way we've done that in the case of the engineering sector is to form a partnership with them. So SHEP, the Safety and Health Engineering Partnership, is as it says on the tin, it's a means of communicating and providing a two-way communications platform for um, the HSE and ourselves here in industry. So today's webinar, um, it's a good question. Is welding one of the most dangerous jobs in the world? Certainly the Health and Safety Matters Journal argue that it is, and they have all the statistics. Um, and most people will be aware, of course, of most of the rather more obvious downsides of welding and working with metal working fluids. They are inherently dangerous, and the impacts on people's lives and health are fairly um, alarming and fairly long term. But what is often not appreciated is the, the respiratory hazards because they take so much longer to actually become apparent. But when they do, the effects are at the very least very unpleasant and certainly life changing. And that's really what today's webinar is all about. It's now a case of trying to find out how best to deal with those threats and those risks and to avoid the unpleasantries for staff who are involved in this kind of activity later in life. We have three uh, experts with us today, um, and they are going to talk to us about exactly those risks. Um, we have Fiona Gary, Matt Bloomer, and Sarah, Pol Sarah Polfreman. I'll introduce each of them separately, but we're going to start today with Fiona. Uh, now, Fiona has been a, an HSE inspector now for over 10 years, uh, and to that extent, she's also the lead in the manufacturing sector for metalworking fluids and engineering. She's been a great help, I have to say, to the um, 
to the, the, the whole CHEP initiative. So thanks to her for that, and a thank you for her contribution today. So on that note, I will hand over. If I could trouble you, as you already have begun to do so, if you could place your questions in the question box whilst the speakers are talking to us, I shall try and keep a track of those and we'll address them at the end of the process. So over to Fiona, I'll just change presenter rights to give her the opportunity to, to take control and hopefully you should have that as we speak, Fiona. Hi everyone, so as Chris said, my name is Fiona McGarry and I'm an inspector for the Health and Safety Executive. So I'm the national lead for engineering and for metalworking fluids as well. So today I'm just gonna briefly run through a case study, tell you a bit more about the health risks from metalworking fluids and what control measures you should put in place. And then Matt's up next after me and he'll explain a bit more about the fluid quality side of it. Hmm. Sorry, it's not letting me flip through the slide. There you go. So the main cause of um, inhalation risk is from inhaling mist and that can cause occupational asthma and occupational hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The exact causal mechanism isn't known, it's thought to be some combination of the ingredients that are in the fluid concentrate, the things that are added to the fluid concentrate, things like biocide and additives, and also things that contaminate the metalwork and fluids during its use, so that's things like microorganisms and fines. So there's two main sources of inhalation exposure that I'm going to go through today, so one of which is opening the machine doors on computer numerically controlled or CNC machines. These machines run at really high speeds, so they create a lot of mist. And it's when those doors are opened immediately after machining that the operators are exposed. And also when using compressed air to blow down either components or machine surfaces. In terms of skin, the major causes are from wet work, so that's just frequently having wet hands, and from direct skin contact with metalworking fluids. The areas that are commonly affected are the hands, arms and torso. And again, the causes of that are the sort of substances that are in the metalworking fluids and things it becomes contaminated with. So again, metal fines can have sort of an actual degrading effect on the skin. So there's various tasks where skin exposure occurs, things such as mixing, decanting and topping up fluid sumps, handling wet components, either for inspection or when they're being removed from the machines, using compressed air guns, and also during sump and machine cleaning if the right sort of tools aren't being used. So the case study obviously had a massive effect on the company. They were actually prosecuted in relation to this and they were fined £800,000 and there was the negative publicity that went with that. But it's really the effect on the three individuals that I wanted to talk you through. So the first gentleman, he can still work with metalworking fluids, but he needs to wear full face respiratory protective equipment all the time. The second guy, he has had to change his job. He basically is so sensitised, he can't be exposed to metalwork and fluids at all. He was a skilled CNC machinist, he'd been with the company for over 20 years and he's had to move to a less skilled role. And on the third man, it had really life-changing health effects. He's been really severely affected. He needs an oxygen task tank to perform simple tasks like even walk into his kitchen. He coughs almost permanently, he's almost paralysed and to the extent that the judge in the case actually described it as a living death. In this particular case, the machines had got faster over the years, so a lot more mist was being produced, but no LEV was installed. They did have some health surveillance, but they didn't take the right actions when symptoms were first identified. So this is really why it's so important that you put the control measures in place. So the main the key control measure for inhalation is local exhaust ventilation, or LEV, which should be fitted to computer numerically controlled to CNC machines, as I've said, because of the high speeds that they run at. So it should be designed and maintained to effectively extract the mist and to keep it within the enclosure. So that's called being at negative pressure. So that means that rather than letting mist out, it draws air in. You can get various types of systems. You can get a standalone system, like the one you can see in the image where you just have one unit for one machine, or you can get a multi-branch system which will connect multiple machines together. So either it should extract externally, so it should remove that air and take it outside of the workplace, or if it's a recirculating system where that air is going to come back into the workshop, then it needs to have a mist filtration system which effectively cleans the air before it comes back in. And in order to control those really fine mist particles, it should have a high efficiency after filter fitted. Some older machines particularly may have some gaps in the enclosure. They may be open at the top or have other sorts of gaps. 
it's really important to try and retrofit additional panels to enclose them because that means you're containing the mist and it also means the LED is more effective. So another thing that's really important is to have a time delay. So like I said, the peak exposures occur when the operator opens the door as soon as machining is finished. That's either because the mist escapes, as you can see in the image there, or they lean into the enclosure to check on the part or carry out another task. And essentially their heads then engulfed in the mist. And it's these sort of peak exposures across the day that add up and they contribute to sort of the bulk of the exposure of the operators. So you need to work out what the delay is for each machine. It will be different because it will depend on the size of the enclosure and how effective the LEV is. So the way you do that is either using a smoke machine or you can, if that's not practicable, you can use a dust lamp, which will visualise fine mist. So that should be established at the commissioning of the LEV system and then checked again each year at the thorough examination. So once you've worked out what the delay is, you need a way to implement it. The best way to do that is to have it as part of the machine programme because then it's automatic. But that won't work on some older machines. So, for example, machines that don't have guard locking, in which case you can use something as simple as a timer, just so the operator knows the right amount of time has passed. So, as I said, compressed air commonly used for blown down components and machine surfaces, but it creates both an inhalation and a skin risk. So the metal working fluid you can see there is essentially this is a simulation of an operator using metal work and using compressed air, sorry, to blow down components. In this case, the metal working fluid had a dye added to it, which shows up under UV light. So all those sort of glowing deposits you can see on the face and on the clothing, they've all come from that using of compressed air. So there are viable and effective alternatives to using compressed air. I'm going to come on to some of those, but there may be some tasks where it's not reasonably practicable to use an alternative. And in that case, there are still measures you can take to reduce exposure. So you should reduce the pressure to as low as possible. As a guide, about 2.1 bar or 30 PSI is effective. You should also use the compressed air inside the enclosure with the LEV. And also consider getting compressed air guns with longer lances because that removes the operator to some extent from the source. All these measures will also help protect your operators from things such as noise and ejected swarf. So these are some of the alternatives. The top one is a spindle mounted drying fan. So in a CNC machine, that would be in the tool changer and you would add it into the program normally at the end. And then that would be used to sort of clean down the bed, the component and get rid of any swarf. The one on the bottom left is a vacuum gun. So that will deal with small sort of chippings and swarf. And on the bottom right, this is compressed air, but it's actually fixed inside the machine enclosure. So it's incorporated into the machine and cycle, which means it can be used when the machine doors are closed so the operator doesn't get exposed. You can also get a coolant wash gun that can be fitted to most CNC machines and essentially it will draw coolant from the sump, but it's at a much lower pressure than compressed air. So you would use it to flood the bed to get rid of the swarf. Things like washing and degreasing air machines can be used on finished parts. And you can also get swarf vacuums, which can be used to clean the machine surfaces. In terms of skin exposure, you should check the, check the safety data sheet that you get from your supplier because some metal working fluids have hazardous substances in, so sensitizers that can increase the risk of dermatitis. So if the metal working fluid you're using does have those risk phases there, then you should discuss with your supplier if there's a less hazardous alternative you could be using. It's really important that both the biocide and fluid concentration are kept within range because they can increase the risk of dermatitis and Matt's going to tell you a bit more about that. In terms of control measures for skin, if it's a manual machine and it doesn't come with them, then you should retrofit splash guards. You should also, there's a whole variety of tools that can be used rather than using your hands, which is again about trying to reduce this direct skin contact. So things such as brushes, swarf hooks and vacuums. And you can also get sort of automatic and mixing dispensing devices, which can be used rather than the manual mixing of fluid to top up sumps. In terms of personal protective equipment, then operators should use single use nitrile gloves. They shouldn't be reused, but for tasks that are a bit more in depth, like cleaning and maintenance tasks, then you'll need to use thicker chemical resistant gloves. And they'll need to be selected, taking into account the degradation, breakthrough time and permeation rate for whatever the specific substance you're using for cleaning is. It's also really important that operators are trained on how to take the gloves off correctly. It's quite a big source of skin contamination if they're removed incorrectly. So there are posters on the HSC website that explain about how to do that. It's also important to provide um, coveralls and clothing that covers your operator's forearm so that again to reduce that skin contact. And they should be either laundered at work or a laundry service used so they're not taking dirty clothes home with them. 
The last thing I want to talk to you about is health surveillance. This is essentially sort of an early detection of ill health system, ill health symptoms, sorry. It'll look at the health of that specific individual to see whether they're being effective, uh, affected. And it also provides a check on the control measures you've got in place so you can see if they're effective. You should develop and implement your health surveillance system in a conjunction with an occupational health professional, so a competent person, and they'll help you work out what health surveillance is needed and what the appropriate frequencies are for that. In terms of skin, then generally skin checks will be required, and that's if there is you know, frequent exposure to metal working fluids or this wet working that I described earlier. For the respiratory health effects, if there's exposure to mist, then you'll need health surveillance, and that will normally include a respiratory questionnaire and a lung function test. That's everything I wanted to go through, but I hope you will put these control measures in place and use the guidance that Matt's going to tell you a bit more about so you're clear on what it is you need to do. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Fiona. Um, in that case, um, we'll avoid losing any time. And at that point, uh, I'm going to move over to Matt. Just before I do, I've been monitoring the questions. A large number of people have asked about whether or not they're going to be allowed to um, have a copy of the slides after this presentation. And the answer is yes, there will be a selection of the slides and some handouts circulated. And there will also be a recording made available on Visa website. So um, watch this space. Um, don't worry, you don't have to frantically take lots of notes. You will be able to get a copy of the slides and the recording after the event. OK, in that case, let's go to, to Matt. Now, Matt uh, is a chemist with over 10 years of experience uh, developing and working with metalworking fluids, uh, as well as a member of the UK LE, the UK Lubricants Association. Um, the, the special working group there. He's a technical manager for Certas Energy, which was previously Q8 Oils, for those of you who've known him for a while. Uh, and that, that also includes responsibility for the metalworking fluid products and the fluid management services in the UK. Matt, thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you, Fiona, earlier. Uh, I hope you can hear me OK and see these slides. Uh, if not, Chris, do let me know. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction of Chris. Thanks like today. I'm Matt Bloomer, I'm Technical Services Manager for Certas Energy in the UK, and representing the UK LA today. So, in this next session, I'll introduce the Good Practice Guide and discuss the key monitoring techniques for metalworking fluids. So, for those not aware, the UK LA stands for United Kingdom Lubricants Association. And within this is a metalworking fluid product stewardship group, which includes representatives from metalwork fluid suppliers, the HSE and the HSE Research Centre. One of the key aims of the product stewardship group is to provide support and education to improve the health and safety of those working with metalworking fluids. And in recent years, the product stewardship group has signed a group of industry experts and the HSE to work together to produce a good practice guide offering advice on how to work safely on metalworking fluids. So why the need for an updated guide? Well, although standards have improved considerably over the years, the HSC and industry continue to have concerns that employees are still developing illnesses when exposed to metalworking fluids. And evidence of this is seen at even low levels of metalworking fluid mist. And employers have a duty to demonstrate that the risk has been reduced to as low as reasonably practical. In addition, the HSE and UKLA members recognise the need to have updated and consistent guidance across industry. So the Good Practice Guide was produced and is designed for anyone working with metalworking fluids, but especially those with employer responsibilities such as production managers, health and safety managers and supervisors. So the guidebook has been designed to cover a wide range of topics of working with metalworking fluids in a logical structure. This includes an introduction as to what is required by law and the risk associated with metalworking fluids. The guide then goes into more depth on best practice in using, monitoring and the control measures required when using metalworking fluids. Some of these I'll cover in the next few slides. And where possible, we have tried to make the guide informative and practical to show illustrations. And you can see some examples here. 
and the use of equipment which is essential fluid for fluid condition monitoring. So in this final section is a brief introduction into the essential monitoring techniques required for metalworking fluids. So it's important to appreciate that metalworking fluids, particularly water mix, are very complex and contain various chemical components required for them to machine, to cool, and be long lasting in the sump without causing corrosion. And some of these chemical components will have individual hazards and are identifi identifiable on safety data sheets. The overall hazard of the product in its concentrate form is found in section two of the safety data sheet. Now these hazards are reduced when diluted in water. However, it's important to recognise that the fluid is susceptible to contamination from tramp oil, the materials it's machining, and microorganisms, namely bacteria and fungi. And this contamination can present a significant risk to operators through skin and inhalation. So here in the blue boxes, we have listed some good practice measures that should be utilised on a regular basis when using metalworking fluids. Most of these measures, such as PPE, health checks, and machine operation controls, have just been covered by Fiona. And the final box on the right includes regular monitoring of the metalworking fluid and ensuring that the correct fluid parameters are adhered to and methods employed to reduce contamination, such as removing fines and tramp oil. So when it comes to fluid monitoring, here we have a summary of regular checks and useful equipment that can be used. The Good Practice Guide book goes into more detail on all of these two. So firstly, a visual and odour assessment of the metalworking fluid should be taken daily. And this can be a simple check just to make sure the metalworking fluid is as it should be. Concentration should be taken as a minimum weekly. And a refactometer is by far the most common device to do this and very simple to use. And the concentration of the fluid can be calculated by multiplying the reading by the metalworking fluid refractometer factor, which is available from your supplier, usually via a data sheet. The pH of the fluid should also be taken weekly, and this can be done using indicator strips or a pH meter. Most metalworking fluids you'll find are in the higher end of the scale, i.e. the alkaline region. For microbiological contamination, dip slides are generally considered the simplest method but there are other methods which are also valid. Microbiological testing should be conducted weekly, unless consistently shown to be below 10 to the 4 CFU per mil. CFU stands for commonly forming units. If results are consistently below 10 to the 4, then the frequency can be reduced to a reasonably practical level. Last but not least, tramp oil should be checked weekly. Now this could be part of the visual check of the sump surface or measured more accurately by taking a sample in a cylinder and recording the surface oil that separates. So let's expand a bit on dip sides and microbiological testing this is, as this is a key part of, my, of the uh, fluid condition monitoring. As mentioned before, dip sides are a very convenient way of measuring bacteria, fungi and yeasts. For those not so familiar, familiar with them, dip sides are pre-prepared <clears throat> with growth media on both sides, but one side for bacteria and the other for fungi and yeasts. Instructions on how to use these are usually provided in the box and the good practice guide goes into more depth on this too. So this table here is a summary on the levels of bacterial growth and how they represent different levels of control. So below 10 to the 4 in the green, that represents good control and the fluid should be continuing to be monitored as normal. Between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 represents moderate control, where further monitoring or action is recommended. At levels above 10 to the 5, action should be taken. So high levels of bacterial contamination do require action, and in some cases that can mean by-side additions, machine clean out and a fresh recharge. We'll also be aware as well in some cases physical removal of slimes and fungus will also be required. And a key factor of fluid condition monitoring is to keep records as this is a means to demonstrate evidence of control. 
Records of regular checks are required and a record of any actions taken, for example, by side additions, and these should be kept for five years. This could be a simple machine chart, such as a handwritten one here, or electronic records. So just before I finish, I'd just like to mention a few useful links uh, for, for, for further information. Firstly, there is a link to the UKLA Good Practice Guide, but hard copies are also available as well. Probably best talking to your fluid supplier at first instance for that. But there are also various publications available from the HSC, and I've just selected a few of them here. But don't forget too, that sometimes it's possible to ask your fluid supplier for advice. So that's the end of this section. I'd just like to thank you for your time and attention, and uh, I'll pass you over to Sarah, who's going to talk about welding. Thank you very much indeed, Matt. Um, are you giving the uh, control direct to Sarah? Okay, that's uh, five minutes. Thank you for that. Sarah Palfreyman has been with the HSE for over 20 years, and she's been working as a geographical inspector in the West Midlands for 15 of those, I think, 15 or 16, and spent the, the remaining time working in the manufacturing sector for the past five years, uh, taking the lead on welding. So you're going to be talking uh, to us, I believe, about benchmark standards for welding, Sarah. And indeed, that's what it says in your slide. So I will hand over to you or um, give you the floor without any uh, further delay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Yep. So uh, as we just said, uh, I'm Sarah Palfreman. I'm an inspector with the Health and Safety Executive, uh, currently working on the manufacturing sector, and I'm the national lead for welding. So essentially today, and um, this presentation that I'll give will look at what inspectors are essentially expect, uh, looking to see when they come to see you. So if they undertake a visit, what control measures they'd like to see in place. And also this will help you check if you've got the control measures in place and if they're adequate, and if not, what you'd need to do to uh, bring them up to speed. So a bit of a uh, background for those who may not be aware. So back in uh, 2018, the International Agency for Research on Cancer concluded in a report um, in July that all welding fume can cause cancer. Um, so that is primarily lung cancer, but also there is some evidence in relation to kidney cancer. And the key thing for HSE here is that by concluding all welding, it uh, brought into play mild steel welding fume, um, which was something that we hadn't enforced on in the same way before. So um, as the regulator, we referred the outcome of the IARC report to the Workplace Health Expert Committee for an independent opinion, and they wholeheartedly supported the outcome of that report. Um, they, we then put a uh, put a report about those findings to our regulatory committee and the outcome of that was that HSE had a policy change on enforcement in particular in relation to mild steel welding. But essentially what that did was just brought mild steel welding fume control um, in line with the, the controls that were already required if you were welding things like stainless steel or other exotic metals. Welding along with metalworking fluids was the focus of the fabricated metals campaign in 2019-2020. Um, but because of the change in regards to mild steel, we had a safety alert was issued. I undertook a number of seminars and presentations. We had a lot of communications around that and um, a, a redevelopment of our guidance to bring everything in line, basically. So what is the risk from welding fume? Well, they can cause serious lung diseases. The key one is occupational asthma, but as I just mentioned, now there is a link to uh, cancer. So car harms caused through inhalation of the fume during the welding processes. The exposure levels that people will uh, receive are very much dependent on how long they're welding for, how much fume's been produced while they're welding, what type of welding they're undertaken, um, what consumables being used, and obviously what type of protection or exposure protection that's being given for them. But the key thing is we don't know at what level harm can be caused, and therefore controls are needed essentially for any welding process that's being undertaken. So what are the types of welding that are available? So um, I'm not going to go through them all, but essentially these are the different types of welding and they will produce different levels of fume. 
Um, generally, when we're out inspecting the most, the ones that we'll generally see in use are the MIG-MAG type welding. Um, we do tend to see TIG welding quite a lot, but that's more uh, when we come across specialised production. And there's also somewhat of a myth that there isn't actually any fume produced with TIG welding. That isn't the case. Um, it's just very pi fine particulate. And if you viewed it alongside a light source, a lot of fume would actually be evident. Uh, resistant spot welding, we do have some fume come on that, but obviously not, uh, not as in at high volume as some of the other welding processes. So essentially, this is what we're trying to avoid. Now, this photo would have been used, um, would have been taken whilst using a dust lamp so that you could see all of the fume. So a lot of what you see here wouldn't be visible to the naked eye. But this fume consists of very fine particulates of metal oxides, mainly from the welding rod or any wire being used. And the composition, as I said, will depend very much upon the type of metal that's actually being welded. Mild steel fume will mainly consist of iron oxides, uh, but likely to be manganese within there as well. And stainless steel and other exotic type metals will contain nickel and chromium, which are highly toxic if inhaled. And there is an element sometimes of nickel and chrome in mild steels, all depends on the actual uh, type of mild steel that you're welding on. So you may have heard of workplace exposure limits, so that's sort of a limit that you need to work towards or ideally below. There is no workplace exposure limit for welding fume, and that's due to the complexity of the fume. We can't, the fume will differ depending on the work that's been done. So there is no well for welding fume, but there is for some of the constituent metal components. So the likes of chromium, nickel, or manganese. And if you're gonna be doing any fume monitoring, then you should seek guidance for an occupational hygienist. So what do we want you to do as a duty holder? So you need to be making sure that exposure to any welding fume released is adequately controlled using engineering controls, typically local exhaust ventilation, where that's reasonably practicable. Um, that's because, as we saw in the previous picture, it isn't just the, the welder themselves that's exposed to this fume. Fume plume is created and that fume will go elsewhere and can potentially be exposed to those who aren't the welder, who but working in the vicinity. So you need to make sure suitable controls are provided for all welding activities, and that does include outdoor welding. So we've got two distinct exposure groups, what we class as regular welders. So that's daily or weekly welding at any intensity, and it's a part of the business activity that you undertake. And then we will have some occasional sporadic welders. So that's welding that's carried out less than once a week, but the key thing is that it's incidental to the business's core activity and it isn't something that can be planned for. So we'll have high, we'll also have different levels of welding. So we have what we class as high intensity welding. So that's long periods of welding, typically for over an hour in a shift um, or high fume production. So that might be less than an hour, but producing high levels of fume. Um, things such as MMA welding and sometimes MIG welding. There's also low intensity welding, um, which is short periods of welding, so typically under an hour per shift, generally with lower fume production weld types, so TIG or resistant spot welding. And when an inspector comes along, they will be assessing whether you're welding as a regular, regularly or sporadic, and also what level of intensity you're using. So even if you're only welding for a very short period, once a week or every other week at a low intensity level. If that's something that you know you're going to be doing, it's part of the business process that you do, that will still be classed as regular wheel welding, even though it's not every week and even though it's only for a short period of time, because it's part of the process of work that's been undertaken. As opposed to if something is unexpectedly breaks on a piece of your machinery and you need to weld it back together or say in a car garage someone needs to do a quick repair to um, a damaged exhaust something like that then we class that as sporadic it's incidental to the business activity it's not part of the usual routine if you know you're going to be doing it then you should be planning to control it essentially so i've mentioned essentially the first protocol should be engineering controls, and that's usually in the form of local exhaust ventilation. 
and acceptable forms of that will be extracted bench or booth uh, on torch where possible or flexible arm and the choice that you make should be based on a suitable risk assessment it may well be that you use a mixture of all of these different types of um, LEV based on the different parts that you produce. There isn't one size fits all. It's very dependent upon the situation. And as I said, very much based on your assessment of your job that you do. So if you look at the extracted bench or booth, it's very much for use with small to medium sized articles. Um, where for our, if you look on the HC website, we've got some videos in relation to this. And this was very much the highest performing level of control that we found when we were out doing some doing some of these videos but obviously you can't do big you can't do big jobs on there it is very much as i say for the small to medium sized ones obviously it doesn't require any repositioning by the operator um, so it's got a good fixed level of capture um, you need to enclose as much of the bench as possible while you're working with it again to get a good pull um, and you can use turntables or jigs or anything like that on this as well. So it works very well for certain pieces of kit, essentially. There is on torch. It works well for large work pieces. It's very much for MIG welding at the moment. Um, and you do need to, um, you would need to buy a new MIG welding set, essentially, because you can't, uh, you can't fit it to on an, onto an existing system. It is it's really effective because it's integrated to the welding gun. You can move it along with the weld. You don't have to reposition your uh, welding piece or the operator doesn't have to reposition himself. You can adjust the extraction slot on the tip. Um, it works very well for long, long runs of straight welds. But we're also aware there are limitations. The extraction unit needs to be located close to the welding area. We know it's, as I said, it's effective on long straight runs. We know it's not as effective if you've got to work in corners or there's lots of bends within the workpiece. And also it works better if you're working down into doing sort of a fillet weld or a groove weld rather than if you're welding in the overhead position. But again, where it can be used is very, very practical and works very well as an extraction system. The majority of what we see out and about is flexible arm and this was very apparent in the last inspection campaign. Uh, it's useful for large work pieces uh, where there's maybe the, the bigger or more effective LEV systems aren't practicable in that situation. But because of that, the hood design and the position of the hood is critical to make sure that the extraction's working as it should. It needs to be repositioned as and when required by the welder to make sure that it's pulling as much fume away as possible. And therefore, it's critical that you have correct training of your welders so that you can ensure that suitable control is maintained throughout. Now, either alongside LEV or where LEV isn't reasonably practicable, uh, then we would push towards uh, the provision of um, respiratory protective equipment. Excuse me. Um, where, as I said, where LEV isn't reasonably practicable or um, where you're welding outdoors, where fume control or where fume control cannot uh, provide adequate control alone. If you see from this picture here, you can uh, see some small fines behind the gentleman's head there. That's some of the ones that we're looking to protect with the uh, protect the the user from um, with the RPE. So, um, you as I said, you may need this as supplementary if your LEV isn't working to capture everything. So, any suitable RPE will have an approved protection factor of twenty. So APF 20, and essentially that can consist of a disposable mask rated at FFP3, a half mask system rated at P3, or a powered respirator system rated at TH2. Now, if welding is carried out for more than an hour a day, then you should really be using a powered respirator. A tight fitting one isn't suitable. 
Um, all RPE provided should have an RPE management program, so that looks at proper storage, um, user treks, filter replacements, etc. And you also need to ensure that any RPE you are using is compatible with any other PPE you have to use during the process. Also, you need to remember if you're using tight fitting RPE for under an hour, then you need to ensure that any wearers are uh, clean shaven and that you're also carrying out a face fit test for those users. So if we move on to um, cost assessment, so any cost assessment should include the hazardous properties of the substances. It should look at the level type and the duration of the exposure. So what's the welding process that you're undertaking? How long are you doing it for? Is it high fume generation? Um, it looks at the circumstances of the work. So what's the metal that you're working on? What's the size of the component that you're working with and, and what consumables are being used? Because they can also have a big impact on fume production. And the assessment is essentially required to determine the level of risk that you've got and therefore um, what control measures you need to put in place in order to either prevent or suitably control exposure. There will also need to be some form of health surveillance depending on what metal you're working with. Um, there isn't requirement for health surveillance if you're only welding with mild steel, although you should still be aware of if any of your workers are identifying any health issues that they may have. Um, but you do need to provide respiratory health surveillance where any of the metal that you're welding is a known asthmogen. So asthma health surveillance includes things like a baseline questionnaire and spirometry, um, further questionnaire at six and 12 weeks post start of work and then annual an annual questionnaire and spirometry so that will be if you're working with the likes of stainless steel or ex other exotic metals that contain nickel and chromium um, then this is the type of uh, uh, surveillance that's going to be required you should also consider biological monitoring for chromium um, that will show up in urine you'll get a much early detection and it will pick up things um, potentially whilst there isn't any actual implications on the respiratory health. So if we look at information instruction and training, again, that's key for some of your operators, particularly as, as I said, where anybody's using movable hood, but also just generally for awareness of the risks that they might be exposed to. So do the machine, uh, do well, your welding operators um, or supervisors understand the risks from the substances that they're working with? Do they know what symptoms to look out for for any ill health provision? Provision and who do they report those to? Do they know what control systems are in place, so their LEV or their RPE? And do they know how to properly use those systems as well? Um, also, part of your cost assessment should be about um, identifying and reviewing your cost assessment should anything come out of um, come back from your employees, looking at things like poor health, poor health issues that they've identified. So there's a wealth of guidance available. Um, from they have got the HSC welding microsite, which was fully updated and reviewed in 2019. Once we'd um, had the report from IARC, we were focusing on it for that inspection campaign. There's the um, WL Cosh Essentials series, which will detail again all the control measures required for different systems, um, not only focusing on welding, but also cutting and surface preparation and cleaning is in there as well. Simple by simple guides to buying or using rather local exhaust ventilation but again I would advise you to look at um, to work in consultation with um, a ventilation engineer to ensure that you're getting something that works for you and your requirements and we've also got the practical guide to RPE at work again tells you what kind of things you need to be focusing on if you're using RPE and what you need to be doing legally to to make sure that things are working for you. There's also the BOHS Breathe Freely selector tool on the BOHS website. Um, HSE worked in conjunction with BOHS to help produce this um, online tool. Click into the link. Essentially, it's got four simple questions that you can answer about how often you're welding for, what you're welding on, how big the welding piece is. 
takes you through a simple guide and should produce from you uh, produce at the end a control measure that it thinks you should be using in order for the process that you're doing. It'll also grade that control measure so you know whether you need to also be using say RPE alongside the LEV or wh whether you need to be providing um, any other controls. And that's also available in a printable PDF so you can print that off, keep it alongside your cost assessment and make sure that things are working as they should for you. So essentially that's everything from me. We'll just leave you to post any questions that anybody may have and I'll hand back over to Chris. Thank you. Lovely, thank you very much indeed for that, Sarah. That brings our, our formal presentations to a close. Um, I will, uh, Sarah has indicated, we should now be looking at a slide which says Q&A session. Um, now, to do this, what I'm going to suggest is that we actually stop sharing screens and that we actually see everybody on screen. So if I could encourage all of our speakers to come on screen um, so that there is a sense of communication, if you like, between our audience and yourselves. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I have a whole host of questions have come in through the, the questions box. Um, now, um, despite my best efforts during the speakers' presentations, I couldn't decide on how they were ordered, so you'll have to forgive me if I appear to dip and uh, jump around a little bit. Um, but there are also a couple of other uh, comments have been made regarding mentioning the British Occupational Hygiene Society's online directory, uh, which can be which is recommended, and um, also uh, a suggestion to direct attendees to the BOHS website. Uh, www.breathefreely.org.uk uh, and we will be mentioning that a little bit later but let's jump into the questions now we have at least 15 minutes um, and uh, Adam during uh, what would have been uh, Sarah's presentation said would you recommend biological monitoring every 12 months I would speak to an occupational hygienist um, and also consult occupational health and look okay. at the type of it's important what what metal you're welding on as I said chromium is is um, can be detected in urine and it can be detected a lot earlier than it will show in respiratory um, surveillance so if you're picking up chrome in urine you can put you can put your control measures in place a lot earlier than if you wait for respiratory health to be affected Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, I think this one's another one that dropped in whilst you were speaking. It says, would you advise occupational hygienists to avoid taking airborne samples altogether and instead offering a qualitative analysis of MWF exposure via DRAMS with Tyndall Beam Analysis, backing this up with an audit of the client's fluid quality management system? I think that's for me, actually, Chris, because it's on that work. Of okay. So yes, we are suggesting that um, occupational hygienists focus on measures such as DRAM, so direct area monitor particle counters, and also things like just the dust lamp. As Sarah showed in those images, it's really good at visualising where the mist is. There are various, you know, actual air monitoring me methods that can be used, but as the metal working fluids have changed, for example, borons, not in as many fluids, there are still some that you can use regardless because they just work on sort of counting the actual particles but yeah we're quite happy for people to focus on sort of more real world measures where you can actually see the difference and yet you know if you're looking at the fluid quality as well that's obviously also helpful mm -hmm. okay thank you Fiona I'll keep moving on fast to get through as many of these questions as we can um, would the HSE expect to see an LEV in use for welding outside where the operator is wearing an air-fed welding respirator no, I think we've accept that um, our LEV is probably going to be impracticable outside. If you can use it and you've got a system uh, to take it outside, there are some systems that can be used outside, um, then great. But I think where there is a level of expectation for us that we would generally see powered RPE or tight fitting RPE being used outside because that's more likely to be the most practicable situation. Excellent. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, another Sarah says, with welding, does urine need to be dipped to look for microscopic hematuria, i.e. blood, as early as an early sign of cancer? 
I will take that question away because that's something I wouldn't want to answer. I'd like to speak to either our occupational health inspectors or our medics with regards to that. Okay, that's fine, Sarah. I understand that because it's quite a sensitive issue. Um, Gavin has said, with LEVs for CNCs, does that only include industrial stroke professional machines or does it include smaller, what he's described as hobbyist machines? And also, does this include open milling machines and lathes? It depends if the machine's being used at work. So obviously our regulations only apply if you're at work. So if it's a hobby machine, i.e. you're using it in your garage, then mm -hmm. I would suggest you do have it because it protects your health, but there's no obligation from HSE to provide that. The, okay. In terms of LEV, we're focusing on CNC machines, so the computer numerically controlled ones because of the high speeds they run at. There are some mm -hmm. manual machines that can produce mist. Grinding machines is something we're looking a bit more at and we are hoping to produce some guidance on that. But in terms of a standard manual milling machine, we wouldn't expect to see LEV at that. It's the CNC machines that are the main push. Excellent. Thank you, Fiona. I appreciate our speakers being as brief as, and to the point as they are as well. It means we can get through more questions. Uh, will HSE accept air feed masks and general good ventilation to remove fumes? That comes from Hugh. Presuming that's for welding. Um, I think so. I, it's at 12.41, so you were speaking, Sarah. Um, good general ventilation and air fed respirators, uh, we would accept for certain processes. So um, a long long use of things like TIG welding or resistant spot welding where the fume production isn't as strong. I think if that's what you're relying on, there'd need to be a good justification as for, for an inspector on site as to why LEV isn't practicable for you and why that's the only route you can go down. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, one from Amanda here. Why is welding subject to adequate control in inverted commas rather than ALAR? Uh, because it's, uh, although it is a known, although the, um, it's been proven that it is cancer causing, it's not a defined carcinogen uh, under the COSH regulations. It's not in the schedule in schedule in the schedules within COSH and it can only be required to be a LARP if it is within one of those schedules and therefore a carcinogen by definition. It's it's a legal issue rather than uh rather than HSE's option for it. What I would say is we won't a LARP we're not enforcing on under a LARP, but we'd still expect you to be doing everything you can to control the risk as well as you can. Sure. OK, thank you. Um, running down in order, I do apologise if we don't get to your question. There is no, there, there are random selection. Why is LEV control not identified in the general requirements slide? That's from Melvin. And that was at 12.23. So I'm guessing that might have been your slides, Matt. Uh, under the general, I think uh, I mean, it should have been included, you know, LEV is kind of expected to, um, <clears throat> as a part of the general sort of uh, protection. I mean, we had to kind of covered it a bit under the CNC sort of machining and, and the other type there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, one that um, I think came up. Um, sorry, they're still coming in fast here. Um, where LEV filters recirculate, should alarms, audible and visual, be fitted to warn the end users? They should have some method of checking that the filters aren't blocked. So that could be like an airflow monitor, which would have that effect. You can get like a traffic light system. You mm -hmm. can on some other LEV systems that potentially might be used in welding, you could get a lower level sort of indicator. But yes, we do advise that system should be fitted with some method to ensure that the filters aren't blocked, because otherwise the system's not doing what you've put it there to do. Sure, sure. OK, here's an interesting one. I'm not sure if anyone can answer this, but Adrian's asked, where can companies go to find competent LEV engineers to undertake system design and testing? I would refer people, I don't know if Fiona or Matt can add into this, I would always say to people, have a look at um, the uh, ILEV website, I-L-E-V-E. -E. Um, mm -hmm. And I think through there, it can actually guide you towards uh, certain LEV engineers, if I'm correct in thinking. But that would be my, for, my first port of call. They're the Institute of Local Exhaust Ventilation Engineers. <laughs> yeah, I see Matt nodding there. So uh, clearly there's some agreement there. Um, 
when using a flexible arm LEV, which requires repositioning, in what form would the training be expected? Would a briefing be sufficient? I would personally get in touch with the provider or the manufacturer of the piece of kit itself and get to get get them to come in and have a look at your process, what work you're doing and get them to speak to the um, operator or provide you with some guidance for you to develop some kind of training system for your operator. OK, thank you. Uh, an awful lot on the welding here. What would the minimum requirement expect to be expected if welding on the factory shop floor on a breakdown where LEV may not be available? Others may be in the area. You've got to look at what type of repair work you're going to be doing. So the actual person doing the welding activity, the repair as such, um, a tight, fitting, a tight fitting respirator or so disposable tight respirator will probably be suitable. If you have a, if you have a portable LEV system on site, then utilise that. Um, if you're going to be doing work, then it may well just be that you need to get people out of the air, either move the person doing the repair work, if they can you move it, move it while they're repairing. If the mm -hmm. person has to be in situ, then it might mean that you've got to move your workforce out of the way while that work's been done. Yeah, and to some extent, I think that might address Emma's question, which was, what is the control expectation for welding fumes for bystanders of welding activity? Presumably, you move them out of the way. Is... Yeah, well, that's, I mean, and that is the required, that is why, essentially, your first port of control is local exhaust ventilation, because that takes fume from source. So it, it should protect others around the area and not just the person that's actually undertaking the welding activity. Okay. Um, what do you consider to be residual fume? Is there a detectable limit? Are there any LEV systems that remove 100% of the fume? On torch extraction is uh, very good at removing the fume, but as I said, we're aware there are limitations and they can't be used in every process. So what we'd say is we'd encourage people to try all that, get somebody in and see if that works for you. Um, from our inspector's point of view, what we're asking them to do when they're out and about is it when you walk in and somebody is welding is it evident that there is fume around is there an evident haze is there an evident mist that isn't being taken out if people want to actually physically assess it then you need to be bringing the lights for an occupational hygienist in and looking at it like we saw with that photograph under a, under a dust lamp and see okay. are you controlling all the fume or not uh -huh. okay Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I've tried to change the time. This one was at 12.08 when you were speaking, I think, Fiona. Uh, we don't do CNC. We well piped on customer sites. How high a risk is this? I think that's welding, isn't it? More for Sarah again. Yeah, someone was obviously yeah, look, thinking ahead. They don't do C. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure what they mean by they don't do CNC, but if they're welding on site, did they say? Yes, we well yeah. piped on customer sites. How high a risk is this? Again, it depends what metal you're working with and it depends what type of control measures you can you can have in place where you're working. If you can use portable LEV, because um, again, you might consider that that actual individual isn't doing much work at that site, but how many sites are they working at during that day undertaking that same role? So is there portable LEV or is there an air fed respirator that they can utilise? Well, as they're going from site to site. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, here's an interesting one. I'm hoping Matt might be able to field this one. It says, quite specifically, page 32 of the UK LA guidance says smoke pens can be used to check clearance times. This is not accurate. A smoke pen will not generate enough smoke to fill a chamber. Would a larger smoke machine not be required? I can say that, Matt. We've updated that in version 2.2. Because it, that is correct, you would need a smoke generator to fill the enclosure. The smoke pens can be used to check for leaks, but not to carry out the, the sort of, to establish the clearance time. Okay, okay. Now I'm conscious we're two minutes to one o'clock. Um, if, as we have so many questions, I did check with our speakers, they are happy to stay on after one. Um, we still have a fair number of people on the, uh, on the call. So uh, what I'm going to do is um, quickly share screens again, and then we'll continue in a couple of minutes with the questions, and people can stay on as long as is reasonable to try and have uh, as many of these questions answered as possible. Um, so uh, before I do, a couple of slides I would like to share. Um, one is the, the Breathe Freely 
uh, slide here on the, from the British Occupational Hygiene Society. We've already had some discussion uh, among some of the questions on that. And um, this will be circulated, but you can check out the Breathe Freely uh, option. And the other thing that we should do is actually thank some of the contributors uh, who have enabled us to make this all happen. Fiona, we know well from her presentation, has also been hugely active within SHEP, and we thank her for that contribution. Lydia Barber and Rebecca Crossland, without their input uh, from respectively Filter Mist and Beezer, again, SHEP wouldn't be able to function. Uh, they put a lot of time and effort into to helping us, and of course, we couldn't actually hold the webinar without the right platform and we're indebted to David Preece and Martina for, uh, from Visa for enabling us to do that. So that's the official closure time. We'll now go, now go back to the questions um, and I've noticed we still have 750 people so there is clearly still an appetite for those questions. Um, let's continue for as long as we, we feel we can. I'll, I'll take um, comments from the, the speakers if they have to leave early, but we'll continue for now. Um, regarding dip slide testing, what does the HSE regard as a reasonable time frame for repeat testing of the fluids after weekly testing has illustrated good control, allowing for extended time frames between testing? I mean, <laughs> You have to, it depends if something happens so 